Hey, Jay, during the talk, do you want to go off? Do, are we going to turn our cameras off or leave them on? Uh, we'll go off during the talk. Okay. Hello, everyone. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay, hello, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Center on Race and Social Problems at the University of Pittsburgh. My name is Jay Hughley. I'm the interim director uh, here at the center. We are super excited to have you with us today for the second in our CRISP cast series. This one focused on um, xenophobia and COVID-19. And we have a, a, an awesome guest with us today uh, to talk about these issues. and. Uh, I bring greetings on behalf of our university, on behalf of my uh, uh, partner in crime, Dr. John Wallace, who's our senior faculty for research here at the center. And just a little bit of background on who we are and what we do. Uh, our mission is to conduct and disseminate applied social science research on race, color, ethnicity, and their influences, on their influence on the quality of life for all Americans. And if you want to get more information, you can visit our website, you can follow us on social media and um, stay abreast of everything we're working on and many issues related to COVID and race in America more generally. So just notes for how we operate these broadcasts. First of all, if you are interested in continuing education units, we do provide those. We will send a follow-up email for you as a participant you can respond to that email. Uh, there's a survey within that email that will ask you if you're interested in, in continuing education, you can respond and get registered for that. When, if you wanna ask a question, and we will certainly encourage you to do so today, just load your question into the chat function and we will respond to your question. You can also tweet your question at PitCrisp and we will be monitoring the Twitter account as well. And today's lecture is being recorded, so you will get a chance to review this again or share it with your colleagues, uh, team members as we go forward uh, after today's event. So we'll make that available to you also in an email following the event. So with no further ado, I'd like to turn it over to uh, Dr. John Wallace, uh, our senior uh, faculty fellow for research and engagement here at the Center on Race. Dr. Wallace, how are you today? I'm excellent at getting better, Jay. How are you? you no, know, I was going to say the same thing. I'm excellent. <laughs> yeah. So it's a pleasure today. We're uh, thrilled to welcome Dr. Richard Lee. Dr. Lee is a distinguished McKnight professor and associate chair for research in the Department of Psychology at the University of Minnesota. He's the past editor for Cultural Diversity and Ethnic Minority Psychology and currently the chair of the Asian Caucus for the Society for, or for Research on Child Development. Uh, his work looks at risk and protective factors in immigrant, refugee, and racial minority youth and family, including racial and ethnic identity, uh, perceived discrimination, acculturation, uh, and cultural socialization. He's published well over 100 peer-reviewed journal articles, and his research has been funded by the National Institute of Health, as well as the National Science Foundation. Uh, more importantly, Dr. Lee has uh, a wife, two sons, and he enjoys karaoke, bicycling, and camping and canoeing. 
Uh, so we're excited today to welcome Dr. Richard Lee. Thank you uh, for having me and thank you for the nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be presenting today uh, for everyone. I'm going to just quickly share my screen. Okay. Well, I promise not to sing any karaoke uh, to start this uh, webinar, um, but I do look forward to hearing other voices um, after I give a brief uh, overview of this topic, COVID-19 and xenophobia in the Asian American community. So I'll just start with the basic definition of xenophobia. This is from Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And I provide it because um, I want to distinguish xenophobia from uh, discrimination, racism, and hate crimes that are prevalent in society today. And so xenophobia here, as you can see from the definition, is the fear and hatred of strangers or foreigners or anything that is strange or foreign. And so in this context today, uh, during the pandemic, we're really talking about individual and collective fear and hatred toward Asian, Asian Americans, who despite their nativity or citizenship or permanent residency here in this country, are continually perceived as foreigners um, in our society. And this is from the Human Rights Watch organization, and it is citing the Secretary General for the United Nations, um, talking about how the pandemic continues to unleash a tsunami of hate and xenophobia, scapegoating and scaremongering. And it urges governments to act now to strengthen the immunity of our societies against the virus of hate. I bring this quote up because we know that in, in our country, as elsewhere, uh, politicians, leaders, including our own president, Donald Trump, and his Secretary of State, have used race-based language, uh, racist language, um, to describe the current COVID-19 pandemic using words like Chinese virus or Wuhan virus. Others have, um, in the administration, have um, used disparaging terms like um, the Kung flu. And I think this is really capturing how xenophobia in many ways is being instantiated within our political structure and government and how that type, that then leads to uh, institutional and structural racism uh, that makes dealing with xenophobia and racism even more difficult because it's no longer now just an interpersonal issue that people are facing. It is now something that is systemic throughout our nation and world. And you can just see from these headlines that uh, there is a rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans, blaming Asian Americans or, and those of Asian descent for um, the current pandemic. This is just some more headlines showing uh, the rise in these crimes being documented uh, by various media outlets and organizations that follow um, racism and uh, hate in the world. And just yesterday in our neighboring state, uh, or my neighboring state of Wisconsin, we see this uh, hate crime incident that took place at Stevens Point against uh, Asian Americans in their community, particularly focused on uh, Hmong uh, community, which is uh, quite large in Wisconsin and Minnesota. And here the person, the suspect, um, uh, openly admitted that he chose uh, these people to make the comments to harass them because of their ethnicity. And despite this rise, 
we have to put this in the context of the fact that hate crimes against Asian Americans has actually been on the decline, um, according to the Census Bureau and FBI crime data. You could see that actually hate crimes have gradually been decreasing over the last 15 years. And so the pandemic has really um, started to sort of change the curve of uh, violence against Asian Americans. Now there is a great irony to this um, as uh, noted here in this headline, um, because like millions of other racial minorities and immigrants in this country, Asian Americans are on the front lines in healthcare, education, and service industries that are deemed by our governments as essential services. And so while they are um, actively providing all these services and resources to the community, it is the community in turn that is responding oftentimes um, with this uh, xenophobia. And these are just uh, from NBC News website, uh, just providing some examples of the types of individuals who are currently on the front line during the pandemic, including um, here you can see uh, David Ho, who um, was a famous uh, HIV researcher back in the 80s and who is now shifting his research toward understanding um, how to better treat COVID-19. But you see, it's not just people in healthcare, it's also restaurant owners, small business owners, delivery workers, um, people working in the nonprofit industry. And so we see that Asian Americans, like all other communities in this country, are uh, doing their part to um, continue to keep our society moving forward. And there is also now resistance and pushback within the Asian American community. Uh, doctors and nurses beginning to speak out more uh, vocally about um, the verbal abuse and physical attacks that they're experiencing in the hospitals. Asian American politicians beginning to um, demand uh, greater action by the federal government. Um, and also local individuals and bystanders who are coming to the aid and assistance of Asian Americans as they are being uh, harassed um, by others because of the color of their skin. And we also see that uh, the media, um, educators, and uh, libraries and other um, organizations are now beginning to gather material to help communities learn how to better respond to what some are calling the coronavirus racism. Um, and so there are an increasing number of resources being made available, including webinars such as this one here at Pittsburgh. And so I want to shift now to really um, opening things up for uh, Q&A. Um, and I want to pose two questions for everyone to, to think about and to offer insights on. One is, uh, how are Asian Americans affected by responding to and coping with the rise in xenophobia and racial violence? And also, what are the effective strategies for helping Asian American families and communities. I have a few more slides, but I did want to take a moment to see if uh, there are questions or comments um, from others. I don't know if uh, Jay or John, you wanted to um, um, enter back in at this point. I'll jump in and, and just highlight that if you have a question for the presenter, uh, for Dr. Lee, please feel free to post your question into the chat and we will relay the question. So Richard, can you give us a sense of what is it that's accounting for the, that is accounted for the decline over time? Over time, uh, that's a good question. I haven't, you know, um, you know, I think Asian Americans are now becoming a much more visible and vocal um, presence in society. And I think there is a shifting perception of uh, their contributions in society. 
Um, I think for a long time, Asian Americans had been viewed as not American and as um, taking jobs away, right? So when you go back to the 1980s and the auto industry that was failing, and um, the rise in hate crimes and violence toward Asian Americans was, uh, uh, was really high in part because they were, people saw Asian Americans as a threat, right? And there's been ever since uh, Asians uh, started to come to this country has always been this view of Asian Americans as part of a yellow peril, right? That they are a threat to American society and to the way of American life, taking jobs away, uh, bringing in corruption and vices. And I think that stereotype has persisted um, throughout time, but there's been a change in part, I think, because our demographies are changing. Um, the world is becoming more global. I think uh, people are seeing that, uh, you know, the rise in different technologies and uh, popular culture coming from Asia is also shifting people's attitudes. Um, but I think what's really challenging right now is that with COVID-19 and the pandemic that now we're seeing people again looking at Asian, people of Asian descent, right, as this yellow peril. Mm -hmm. So I'll relate one question from the audience, um, and you know, then then uh, we can we can move on or, or take more. Um, but Ashish, I'm Resh, and I hope I'm saying that correctly from Arizona State University. Uh, would like to know what the academic community can do in research or action to help fight COVID-related xenophobia. Yeah, you know, uh, one thing I. Um that we can do in academia is to actually get more out into the public uh, discourse like this. My colleague Erica Lee at the University of Minnesota is a well-known historian. She recently published a book on xenophobia. Her earlier book was on making of Asian America. And Erica is a great example of someone, uh, a public scholar, academic, who's also a public scholar, who's um, really, um, entering into the media space um, to better educate the public on the history of xenophobia and racism and how it has been uh, always a part of uh, the way America has seen itself and the way governments have sort of set forth policies, right? We can go back to uh, early immigration laws that um, excluded uh, immigration from Asia. Um, we could look at how citizenship and how the green card uh, for permanent residence was all shaped by anti-Asian sentiment over time. And I think, so having historians like herself uh, becoming public scholars is important. For social scientists and behavioral scientists like ourselves here, I think what we could be doing is uh, both basic and applied research that can help uh, address these issues and also edu provide training and education for both parents, families, and educators as well, right? Because we're going to see xenophobia and racism happening in the classrooms. Um, I can give an example of uh, when social distance learning, for example, began for um, public schools or for school children. Uh, people were starting, the kids are starting to move toward using uh, Google Docs and uh, Google Sheets as a way to both uh, do their schoolwork, but also as a way to communicate with each other, right? And so kids are really great at figuring out how to use technology um, to communicate. And this is before Facebook Messenger for Kids and um, uh, Zoom was really readily available. And so early on, they were using Google spreadsheets and the chat box as a way to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, wow, that's really cool to see them doing this. But then quickly, I started to see how the content of those messages were shifting. And kids were posting images of uh, xenophobic images of China, uh, linking it with the coronavirus. And 
here is where I had to sort of intervene with my, with my wife to really sort of talk with our child about what this is. And he was actually really good at sort of calling it out in that moment through the chat and saying, you know, hey, this is a racist image. You know, if you're going to keep this up, I'm out of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think there are things now it probably helps that my wife and I are pretty well educated. I'm an academic. I study this. And so, but I think this is like one thing we can do as academics, going back to that question is how do we best reach families and educators to prepare them for when these types of incidences in the school or in the virtual classroom happen. Um, from the research side, um, you know, my colleagues and I have launched a number of uh, COVID-19 related studies getting at this issue. So we are in the midst right now of a longitudinal mixed method study. This is and what I mean by mixed method for uh, those out in the community who are listening right now, it's research methods that are both using uh, open-ended questions where we get qualitative text data as well as uh, traditional sort of survey ratings. And in this longitudinal study that we're doing, it's actually with um, looking at sort of how it's affecting the university life at Minnesota. And so we're surveying uh, faculty, staff, graduate students, and undergraduate students. And we've surveyed over 580 people. We're tracking them over three waves during this pandemic, including over the transition uh, as social distancing practices get relaxed. And uh, one of the notable things that we found there is that Asian Americans and other individuals of uh, students, faculty, and staff of color, um, they themselves are not necessarily personally experiencing a lot of xenophobia and discrimination, but the amount of worry that they have is quite significant. And there's this interesting uh, discrepancy that we see called the personal group discrimination discrepancy, where oftentimes people are much more aware of what's happening outside that they themselves may not experience, but they see it happening outside of themselves. And um, so we're starting to note that. And I think better documenting this as researchers is important. Mm -hmm. um, and also our colleagues are looking at um, how are Asian American parents talking with their kids about these things and better documenting that type of socialization practices. So I think academics can do a lot of things. We just need to then move toward getting it out into the public sphere. Sorry for the very long <laughs> answer. Yeah, no problem. So can I, can I switch the direction just a little bit? So yeah. uh, our, our dean asked an uh, interesting and important question. So there's a lot of focus on disparities in COVID-19 uh, cases and deaths. Uh, do you know what the mm -hmm. rates look like across uh, and within the uh, Asian American population? Yeah, you know, um, I was just having this conversation with a colleague of mine yesterday, and I haven't seen the data uh, directly, but she was mentioning that it does not appear that there is much disparities at, at, at least at the level of, at the aggregated level of Asian. Sure. Um, in terms of health disparities. Um, we in Minnesota, I can say, are seeing that um, African Americans and Latinx communities are being disproportionately affected uh, in terms of infection rates and mortality rates, hospitalization rates. Much of that is because of the type of service industries that those individuals are employed in. Sure. Right? So for example, the meat packing plants, um, uh, in Minnesota, which, you know, in the Midwest has a lot of the, um, this type of industry where you see a lot of that type of uh, spread happening. Um, and then also the underlying health conditions that communities often have. Um, so we aren't seeing that in my, as I've read it um, with, within the Asian American community, but it would vary I bet, quite a bit by uh, socioeconomic status as well. Sure. Um, because we are starting to see that, for example, in the Somali immigrant and refugee community in particular, because of the type of employment that they are having, 
um, and the fact that they often are living in more of an enclave sort of setting where it's uh, the dense population, it's harder to control community spread. Sure. Some people would argue that the uh, ethnic label of Asian is useless in the sense mm -hmm. that, you know, there's Southeast Asian, <laughs> there's the Hmong population, Chinese, Korean, and mm -hmm. so forth. So given the diversity within uh, the Asian population, is there differential experience and treatment uh, of those groups? I mean, so on one hand, you have kind of the model minority uh, mm -hmm. perspective, and on the flip side, like I know in, in uh, Minnesota, a large Hmong population, uh, they're often, at least as I understand it, treated very poorly. And so can you talk a little bit about the diversity that exists within those various groups and the extent to which they are treated differentially as opposed mm -hmm. to just this kind of uh, ethnic gloss of Asian? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I mean, Asian American is a relatively new racial construct or term, right? Again, out of the civil rights movement. Um, and it was introduced and popularized in part because it was a way for um, different Asian ethnic communities to collectively come together in solidarity to fight for their civil rights and uh, against racism. And so I think there is still value in the term and in the collective sort of consciousness of having an Asian American label. Um, but for sure, uh, there is tremendous amount of uh, uh, variation in the types of experiences Asian ethnic subgroups have particularly right now. So, um, and we see that also going back to the earlier question about the rise and decline of um, hate crimes. You know, after 9-11, for example, South Asians experienced a tremendous spike in hate crimes against them uh, because they were associated incorrectly with um, being terrorists, right? And thus, thus to be blamed. Uh, for 9-11 and, and similar kinds of uh, attacks. And, you know, so that experience, you know, in, in Minnesota, like you mentioned, the Hmong uh, community is quite large and they often are um, blamed, you know, for a variety of um, issues or problems that may be affecting communities. So I think there is an important need to distinguish um, the different groups and their own unique experiences. And so the question as, as an academic is really, when is it appropriate to study Asian Americans as a group? When is it more important to study particular unique issues within populations? And that's when it's important to really be part of a given community and to learn about their specific unique needs and experiences and then develop programs of research from that ground up perspective oftentimes. So for example, I've done parenting work with the Hmong community and those are the parenting concerns that they have are very different, right? When they're growing, when their uh, communities are residing um, in the urban city versus out in the suburbs and the more recent Im uh, um, immigrants and refugees are having a very different experience compared to because of the acculturation rate. So I think, uh, you know, for sure, understanding the specific ethnic experiences is important for us. Um, but it's just as important to understand how these experiences um, affect all Asian Americans, right? Because oftentimes the way this happens is that one negative experience with one person from one background gets rapidly generalized and spread across all, right? Um, and people don't differentiate and don't sort of recognize that that one incident is one isolated incident. So Dr. Lee, I'm, um, we're at the halfway point and if there is more content that you want to get to, um, mm -hmm. I want to uh, make, give you this moment to, to get to any more content that you have and then you can do it and maybe the next 10 minutes we'll save a lot of time at the end for questions and we've got some great questions coming in from the sure sure and please if i'm starting to just over talk please interrupt me at any time um i do have a few more slides and i thought it might be helpful because some of the questions are already kind of getting at this 
And so I did want to go over, these are a little um, more text heavy, no images. Um, so um, <clears throat> I wanted to go back, I mentioned um, the perception and treatment of Asian Americans uh, throughout American history. And I did want to talk more about the othering of Asian Americans in history. And I had already mentioned um, the, the perception and stereotype of Asian Americans as part of this yellow peril. And this goes back um, to the early immigration of uh, Chinese uh, workers who came and worked the farms and the fields and built the uh, transcontinental railroad in this country. But at the same time, even though they made up less than 1% of the population, they were seen as a threat to uh, the American, uh, the white Americans and their employment opportunities. Again, they made up less than 1% of the population, but they were seen as mainly to be blamed for the challenges other white Americans were having finding jobs. And so they became, uh, viewed as a threat. And then, of course, with um, World War II, that um, quickly led to um, uh, racism and uh, prejudice against Japanese Americans, uh, including the internment of Japanese Americans um, in camps throughout the West Coast. And again, Asian Americans were sort of this view was reinforced that they were a, a, a threat. Um, even, you know, the children, the beloved children's book author, uh, Dr. Seuss, you know, Theodore Geisel was well known for his um, racial stereotyping of Asian Americans. And you can go to any childhood book written by Dr. Seuss and look at the caricatures of Asians in those books. Um, that also aligned with the fact that Asian Americans were seen as, um, as never as American, right? To be American um, means to be white. And Asian Americans uh, have um, always had this forever foreigner stereotype applied to them. That was uh, complicated and, and reinforced by the fact that the Supreme Court of this country would, on the one hand, use Asian Americans to say, well, we acknowledge that South Asian Indians, for example, are um, Caucasian, right? And that distinguishes them as Caucasian. On the other hand, um, they're not white, and so they're not eligible for citizenship. Although we previously said that to be a citizen of this country, you had to be Caucasian. And suddenly the shifting of, of language um, reinforced this idea that Asians in this country um, are always gonna be seen as foreigners. In the 60s into the 80s, we saw the rise of the Asians as being viewed as model minorities. And although, look at how they have come so far despite all these setbacks in society, um, that they are academically succeeding. And this model minority stereotype of Asians sort of uh, glossed over the fact that there's tremendous heterogeneity within the Asian American community, uh, people from various different immigrant backgrounds, educational backgrounds, and so forth. And yet they were still seen overall as being like a success story. And the reason that that story was being perpetuated is because it allowed white Americans to not have to deal with uh, the disparities and the discrimination experienced by African Americans and, and the Latinx community. And it was really a way to sort of use Asian Americans as a wedge group to sort of say, hey, look, uh, if you just pulled yourself up and work hard like Asian Americans, uh, you wouldn't be suffering from the experiences of racism. That racism is an excuse for your lack of work ethic. And it was that sort of problematic racialized argument that was used to, on one hand, elevate Asian Americans above these other groups, but on the other hand, really creating this wedge, which you saw um, magnified uh, during the LA riots in the early 1990s after the OJ Simpson verdict. 
where African Americans and Asian Americans, Korean Americans in particular, uh, were pitted against each other, right? Um, even though the racial tension underlying that was clearly a black white racial tension, right, caused by racism. Um, Claire Jean Kim uh, introduced this idea of racial triangulation in the late, uh, in the 1990s to kind of address how this othering of Asian Americans gets positioned against uh, the valuation of other racial groups. And what she did, I thought, uh, that was really helpful was she talked about how, on one hand, on a y-axis, you kind of see Asian Americans are sort of valued above uh, Blacks or, or Latinos or Native Americans. Um, that fits with this sort of model minority stereotype. On the other hand, if we imagine that there's also an x-axis, that Asian Americans are always seen out here as outsiders not as American, that African Americans, while they may be valued less, are going to be perceived more as American compared to, Af uh, compared to Asian Americans. And this triangulation then uh, reinforced the pitting of minority groups against each other um, and further cemented Asian Americans as always on the outside, never on the inside, never seen as part of the American uh, fabric. And uh, so I think that's really an important sort of framework for us to understand because it helps also understand how xenophobia is playing a role here, right? And so on the one hand, Asian Americans are seen as, you know, on the front line, hardworking entrepreneurs, healthcare workers, and so on. On the other hand, they're still experiencing the racial vitriol of society. Um, we have a, just a five-minute warning. Five yep. Yeah. Sure. Um, the other thing to understand about xenophobia and racism is that um, how we make these attributions is driven in part by the context and the ambiguity oftentimes that we have um, in understanding what's played out. Uh, so in our work, for example, in the work of others, we've seen that um, when a racist incident occurs, we can if it's ambiguous and unclear, then oftentimes people will then, Asian Americans, for example, will chalk it up to it's an honest mistake or misunderstanding. Um, whereas if it's very explicit and clear and, and you know, uh, a, a clear hate crime, it's easier for us to sort of attribute that to racism without um, um, any uncertainty. Um, and part of that is driven in part by um, who else is present in that moment? How validated do we feel our experiences are? If there are other Asian Americans or minorities present, we are much more likely than to make the attribution that it was racist or a hate crime. But if we're by ourselves, um, because we are now in the numerical minority in that context, we're much more likely to sort of question whether or not that perception and experience was accurate or valid. And that's really the insidious part about how racism works is that oftentimes when it happens in isolation, which it often does, um, we will first question ourselves rather than sort of recognize right away that it was racist. Um, and I think what ends up happening oftentimes is that because it happens, the way it happens for Asian Americans is going back to the triangulation framework is that uh, when we experience racism as Asian Americans, it's often a denial of our Americanness. And uh, Satna Chernin at University of Washington has done some great work demonstrating how in those moments, what Asian Americans often do is they reassert more strongly how they are American, right? They suddenly can speak uh, English uh, with greater clarity and fluency they are able to recite all the Family Ties episodes and Cheers episodes to demonstrate their Americanness. Um, but we also then, to, to, when we're denied that Americanness, we also then will then in the future avoid situations where, where that might happen, right? Um, and uh, so one of the things I wanted to sort of, we can leave this up for discussion later, is talk more about how families can engage in racial socialization uh, to prepare their children 
um, how teachers can engage in racial socialization to prepare youth um, for this type of uh, these experiences and, and to not have individuals blame themselves, but to also sort of begin to sort of prepare them um, to best respond to these situations. Um, and so I'll, I'll kind of leave it there for right now, Jay, and uh, take more questions or yeah. Okay, definitely thank you so much for your presentation and your willingness to engage in our audience. And uh, we have left a good amount of time for audience questions. And so we're excited to get to them. And I will kick us off with one from Dr. Jeanette St. Paul here at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center who asks, uh, what evidence have you found regarding differences in xenophobia by underrepresented minorities versus majority citizens? Uh, as far as a xenophobia towards Asian Americans. So do you see variants, or have you read about variants by the groups that are actually actually engaging in xenophobia, whether that's white Americans or underrepresented minorities or other groups? Uh, I, if I'm understanding the question correctly, it's it's asking are, are only whites perpetrating xenophobic? Uh, I think it's Asking, yeah, if there are differences, are there no differences in the rates of, of, of who, yeah, who are the perpetrators of xenophobia? Yeah. Or Asian Americans specifically. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I don't know, I don't know the statistics in terms of, you know, the documenting of the numbers. I, you know, um, based on purely news accounts, you know, it's clearly driven by uh, whites in society, because in part the structure of our society is built where they have the greatest power and they're the most protected, right? Um, and so I think that's for sure. But you also do see tensions across racial groups or between racial minority groups um, that is also concerning. Uh, but a lot of times, as I mentioned earlier, that is driven in part by how Asian Americans are used as a racial wedge group. Um, and so it's really important for Asian Americans, African Americans, uh, Latinx community, Native American communities um, to find interracial solidarity in those moments rather than um, buy into this narrative and discourse uh, that's being perpetuated by uh, white society, um, that Asians are the foreigners, that they're the othered, that they're to blame. Um, and so here I think it's important uh, to recognize that even though there may be instances where Asian Americans and other racial minority communities are in conflict, right, or, but a lot of that is being um, done uh, in part because of the way society and the media has sort of structured the narrative, right, of Asians as the other, they're the ones to blame, they're the easy scapegoat. Right. Uh, another question. So uh, this one's from uh, Danny Rosen, uh, one of our colleagues at Pitt. He says, unfortunately, there's been a long history of tension between the Asian American and African American community in urban areas in the U.S. And uh, there's a parallel occurring in China now with xenophobia mm -hmm. among Chinese against individuals of Afri from Africa working in China. Have you seen any research or attention to this topic? Yeah, you know, that has just come up recently, um, although, I, you know, uh, people in the humanities have, I, have been better studying um, the racial dynamics playing out in other parts of the world. Um, for a long time, a lot of that racialized uh, um, experiences in other countries against African workers, for example, um, was attributed, and I think there's still value to understanding how that's attributed to capitalism and U.S. military presence. Um, you know, if we take the experiences of, um, of the military occupation of Japan and South Korea, for example, right, um, who is, you know, how Japanese and Koreans how they see African American soldiers being treated, right? Um, that becomes the norm, 
for how you're supposed to treat, right, or see. And so if they see African-American soldiers being uh, treated as second class, uh, then that is what's being socialized. Um, mm -hmm. And that that was sort of uh, an early sort of discussion about how perhaps some of this um, um, racial hierarchy is sort of being sort of uh, exported to other parts of the world, right? And of course, globalization and the economy um, kind of perpetuate this, right? Um, and then, you know, in terms of the workers, African migrant workers in China, I don't know a ton about that beyond what I see in the news headlines. Um, but again, I think a lot of this could be driven by capitalism and the militarization of countries, of, uh, you know, in the US presence of the military in other parts of the world. So I think it's a combination of those two that often are the driving force for perpetuation of racial stereotypes and racial violence against groups in other parts of the world. Thank you. So we have a question from Tara Meyer here at the University of Pittsburgh. And um, Tara's question is, most Asian students experience issues off campus. This sort of dovetails what you described earlier about sort of hearing about the, the effects even if people are not directly experiencing them in this case. Students may not experience it on campus, but they're experiencing things off campus. How can we help them cope with off campus harassment? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, um, I think this is where, you know, in higher education, we need to do a better job early on in the orientation of students, new students to campus and to campus life. Um, so, and I think that's where um, just preparing students for their experiences both on and off campus is important. But I think it gets to a larger structural issue, which is what is the relationship between the university and its surrounding community, right? Often universities still maintain this sort of um, ivory tower sort of presence, right? oftentimes plop down right in the middle of, you know, um, a mixed income sort of community or neighborhood, uh, but isolated from that community. And I think this is really getting at where the university needs to be making greater efforts, right, to engaging with their communities and introducing the students to these communities in a mutually beneficial way. Um, and I don't think the universities in general do enough work in that regard. Um, so it creates a hostile sort of relationship between neighborhoods and universities to begin, right? And then you add a minority, right? And all the stereotypes of being perceived as a foreigner into that mix, right? They're the perfect sort of uh, target um, for larger sort of structural animosity that's been building up. Um, so I think that's an issue as well. Um, that we need to uh, figure out. And then, you know, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it at that. Uh, uh, a question from Thea Young. How responsive has the FBI been in, in prosecuting Egon? Well, I think we know that under the current administration, things have not been very responsive yeah, in I general, know. you know. No. The bar of, of something qualifying as a hate crime, whether at the state or federal level, is pretty high. And we're continually seeing instances where um, what are clearly hate crimes are not being prosecuted as such um, by state prosecutors, uh, county or state prosecutors, or at the federal level. Uh, I, I don't see much happening on that front by our federal agencies, unfortunately. What are the statistics on that? I, I'm not clear, that's, out, that's beyond, so I'm not a criminologist, so I don't really study that per se. Um, uh, have, you, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jay, go ahead, Jay. Um, we have a question from Marilyn Fitzgerald. Um, 
Marilyn wants to know what professional groups in, in uh, healthcare, in the healthcare community um, can do to uh, around advocacy and activism for minority populations, not only Asian Americans, but all minorities, mm -hmm. respect to xenophobia. Yeah, you know, this is going to be a longer uh, sustained effort that's going to be needed. And, I, and a lot of that, you are starting to see um, graduate programs in different healthcare, whether it's medical school, nursing, pharmacy, um, trying to find ways to uh, provide cultural competency training as one, one effort. Um, how much of that is superficial versus meaningful training is, is up for debate. Um, you know, 25, 30 years ago when I was in graduate school and coming out of graduate school, I remember that at that time, they were just trying to get med students, pharmacy students, nursing students to develop better interpersonal skills. That it was, you know, and so, I, you know, now it seems like the big push is to try to help them, uh, healthcare providers, develop cultural competency. Um, but you know, I think it's going to have to begin there early on, um, as well as increasing the pipeline. I mean, the pipeline is again a critical issue. Um, increasing the numbers of faculty um, and uh, graduate students in these healthcare professions is going to play an important role um, in shifting the way people understand how to work with populations better. And then I, I also think uh, more community-based healthcare in general is going to be helpful um, rather than expecting uh, communities of color to go into these predominantly white sort of settings uh, to receive care, but actually finding ways to move into the communities is going to be important. So can I a question Richard at a, at a more personal level so as a parent as you think about equipping and preparing your two sons for the world that we live in and I know this is similar to Dr. Hughesley work on African-American parenting mm -hmm. what are what are the strategies uh, that you think about as a parent to you know again to equip your, your, your child for an environment that may not be uh, particularly welcoming yeah you know um, yeah you know, Diane Hughes has really done some pioneering and important work in this area. Um, in our work, we've been really focusing on how understanding how families engage in both with racial socialization, which I have listed here on, on this shared screen, um, but also ethnic socialization. Uh, what, what Diane has referred to as cultural socialization, but I think it's more accurately described as ethnic socialization. And I think this is where for many Asian immigrant families, and I'll, I'll start with immigrant families, the emphasis has largely been on ethnic socialization, getting their kids to value, to have pride in, to understand the customs of, um, to adhere to the values of their ethnic cultural heritage, right? So in my case, as a child, a U.S. born child of Korean immigrants, for me it was learning to be proud to be Korean and uh, to understand all that accompanies that, right? From food and customs to values. Um, my parents almost never directly verbally talked about our race, you know? Um, and when they did, it was oftentimes, as I brought up here, you know, in those moments, learn to assert your Americanness, right? Speak good English, right? Um, avoid situations that might get you into those sort of conflicts, right? And that was about it. It was otherwise, it was sort of keep your head down, work hard. And it was buying into this, you know, it's the internalization of this model minority myth that if you just work hard, you'll avoid racism, which we know is not the case, right? Um, and so oftentimes there was a, a real, there was an acknowledgement that we were minorities, but the message was 
don't fight it, right, directly. Don't address it directly. And uh, that's often the way for many immigrant, not all immigrant communities, and it varies quite a bit based on obviously the, the, the reasons for immigration and the education level and the resources available to families. What we see in our work though is that for native born, US born uh, Asian American families, it's a very different sort of thing. Um, most often what we see is that for US born Asian American parents, that would be like myself, the focus is much more on racial socialization, right? Having your children understand and appreciate um, what it means to be Asian in America, right? And to be seen as Asian and the stereotypes that come with that and learning how to best respond in those contexts, right? Um, so my parents, for example, um, when my kid was on Google Slides and saw comments about China and the coronavirus, my parents probably would have said, oh, you just ignore that, you're not Chinese, <laughs> right? But my wife and I, we were like, this is directly related to you and to us, and here's how. Right, um, and so I do think that, um, you know, one of the issues there is that would be in a way a reactive parenting approach because we're responding to an incident that already happened that my child brought to our attention, right? I think what we need to be better doing more of, and I think this is where most families tend to struggle is more proactively, right? Preparing our children for bias and understanding when you should trust the situation and people and when you should be a little more cautious and mistrustful or vigilant. Um, and that while on the one hand you can kind of aspire for uh, egalitarianism and pluralism, um, you have to also be very mindful sort of of the way uh, language and uh, behavior sort of play out. And so we often will talk to our kids, like when we watch TV, we'll talk to them about, you know, what are the images you see? Why is it on commercials? The main character in a commercial or a TV show is a white person and often a white man, a straight white man. And why is it the Asian American or the African American is, you know, the service worker, right? Or in the background of a commercial, but not in the foreground. Um, and what is it communicating to you? What message are they trying to send about where, where you're valued and where your position in society is? And I think we can have those conversations with kids, whether they're six years old, 12 years old, or 17 years old, that we need to always be having those daily conversations. Um, in the work I do on Korean adoption, uh, Korean individuals raised in white families, this is what we often hear in, this, in that research where, white parents will say I, that they tend to take a reactive approach. I'll address it when it comes up. But what the kids say, what the youth say is, we were wanting our parents to talk about this all the time, but they never would bring it up. And after a while, we learned that it was too sensitive an issue for them, so we'll protect our parents by never bringing it up. Well, if the kid is working so hard to protect their parents by never bringing up racism, the parents will never have a chance to even engage in reactive socialization, mm -hmm. right? And I think that happens true as well in immigrant and, and many minority groups where the kids are experiencing far more than the parents ever know. And if the parents are simply waiting for the kids to bring it up, it's too late because mm -hmm. kids are not going to bring up nine out of 10 times when things happen. Right? And I think that's where we need to be more proactive in the way we are raising our children. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I believe I'm going to ask one more question. Unfortunately, it'll, it'll have to be our last question, uh, given our time constraints, but um, it hopefully can open up interest to other people's questions. And that is, you know, the winner is Wendy Unger gets the last question in here from Pitt. What are the best resources to learn more and take action for positive change, local and national? So if you can point people to any resources they can go to oh, uh, they develop this, this webinar. Um, 
what are resources for it? Yeah, um, I mean, I think one of the great resources that's available is uh, the Teaching Tolerance website for uh, the community and educators, the Teaching Tolerance website. It's very responsive to changes in society and new events happening in society. Um, so I think that's a great resource uh, that's online. Um, you know, I think there are um, many organizations that we could go to. I, you know, I, of course, on the top of my head, I can't think of the, all, all of them at once. Um, you know, but I think that that, you know, there, if people just, I mean, this is where you could literally just Google. Um, if people actually took the time and effort to Google, um, organizations, you know, Asian American racism or Asian American, you know, community or, you know, you're going to find tons, you know, the um, Organization for Chinese Americans has um, worked hard, you know, here in Minnesota, we have the Coalition of Asian American Leaders and the Asian American uh, Organize, Organizing Project, um, AAOP. So I think it's just, it's going to somewhat vary by what state you're in and what local resources are available, but also at the national level, there are organizations. You know, in psychology, we have the Asian American Psychological Association within the Society for Research on Child Development, we have the Asian Caucus. Um, and I think that there are those professional organizations available uh, for academics. Um, and then there's also many smaller community organizations. I, I hope that answers it doesn't give you specific examples in part because I don't know where you are and, and what the resources are in your local communities. Um, but I would encourage people to support those organizations because those organizations are often volunteer based and driven by people who are committed to social justice. But um, like all things, you know, those are, uh, they need financial support to continue to do the good work that they're doing. And uh, if we're only giving uh, money to uh, public radio, you know, we're only supporting more white institutions and we're not providing support for uh, minority serving communities and organizations. Uh, Jay, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, we're out of time and I want to thank Dr. Lee uh, for your perspectives and for sharing with us, sharing your expertise. And um, stay tuned for more Chris Cast. I do want to highlight uh, our friends at the Office of Health Sciences Diversity and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion here at Pitt are going to have another talk uh, on xenophobia and hate crimes next week. So uh, be sure to tune in for that. Many exciting panelists. I'm actually one of them. And so uh, for more information on that, you can go to diversity.pitt.edu. So with that said, thanks. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon, and we will uh, we look forward to seeing you again on the next uh, Chris Cast. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you, everyone.